Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the KJO exclusive session. I'm Dr. Smita Narayanan, and I'm the outgoing editor of the Kerala Journal of Ophthalmology. Our session is titled, Scientific Publishing, How to Improve Upon It. We have as our speakers here, those who have actively contributed to our journal in their various capacities. I thank all of you who have bypassed your postprandial inertia, and I welcome you to this interesting session. Our first speaker today is Dr. Nina. Dr. Nina is going to tell us about how to write a case report. Dr. Nina, please. Thank you, Dr. Smitha and KSOS for this opportunity. So I'm going to tell you how to write a case report. So uh, what is a case report? So it's a perfect way of communicating information to the medical world about a rare or an unreported feature, condition, complication, intervention or a disease by publishing it in a medical journal. So this could be one example. So what is the importance of case reports? They are a time-honored, important, integral, accepted work. It has a firm role in medical literature and some of the well-known diseases were first reported as case reports like Parkinson's disease and Kaposi's sarcoma and even as uh, old as 1600 BC we had this case report of a dislocated jawbone, which is from the art of medicine in Egypt. Why should we report a case? Because as doctors, we treat patients and not diseases, and every patient and every case may be different from the other. So it's a good idea to always note and record the unusual, and publishing it puts it on a permanent record. And such communications are of great value among physicians, and uh, so this is one of the landmark case reports documenting the onset of AIDS, which was published in Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report. And that's how the whole world came to know about the outbreak of pneumocystic carinia pneumonia in HIV-positive patients who developed AIDS. So all you know, your report may be the beginning of a, uh, you know, a series of such reports. So why report a case? It's again a first line of evidence in the medical literature. And for a person who's starting to publish, it's a great opportunity to develop your writing skills and getting a case report published certainly looks very impressive on your CV. So there are some international guidelines for case reports and that's known as CARE. It consists of a checklist of 13 primary items which should include title, keywords, abstract, introduction, patient information, clinical findings, timeline, diagnostic assessment, therapeutic interventions, follow-up, outcomes discussion, patient perspective, and informed consent. So let's see each by one by one. So let's go to the stages in writing a case report. First thing is to find a, a case or a disease which is worth reporting. Then do a proper literature search, collect information related to the case, get consent from the patient, summarize and write it, revise and edit it. So this I've already discussed, the format for writing a case report, it includes the following headings. Your introduction case report should have the following uh, you know, inputs. Discussion should have a review of literature, the arguments that for the case, uh, compare it with what is known, message, recommendations and obviously references. And how do you find such a case? So keep an eye out for unusual cases. Uh, discuss it with the senior consultant. For all you know, consultants have a stack of uh, rare cases which they're just waiting for an enthusiastic junior to come and help them to report it. So always seek uh, opinion from your seniors. Do a literature survey. You can all use all these databases to search PubMed, Medline, Ovid, Embase, and Google Scholar. Look at previously published case reports so that you understand it better. You improve your understanding of the condition and to whether you want to put a unique message in your case report or not, you will get an idea. And by reading the literature, you will also be able to educate yourself on the condition. How to start? So after getting permission from the consultant in charge, in case you are not the primary doctor treating, uh, get obtained patient consent. That is very important because most of the standard journals will ask for a patient consent. And they also have the specific forms which you have to download and fill it. So I already told it, collect and combine the information, record the key points from the examination history, investigations, treatment. Most important thing is make sure you remove all the patient information, anonymize all the data so that uh, you are not giving away the patient's identity and save it in your personal laptop or USB stick. And how do I write it up? 
don't make it very long. Most of the case reports have a standard uh, word limit. Uh, go and uh, read about it. Adhere to the word limits. Try to write it in one stretch and uh, edit the discussion and trim down the article later. So, these are the five important sections, as I already mentioned, abstract, introduction, presentation, discussion and conclusion. So, abstract should briefly summarize the case and its clinical relevance. Why are you reporting this case and what's the clinical importance? Should clearly state the subject and educational value of the case, introduce the readers to the central theme of the case or the article and this actually should be written at the end. Once you write the whole case report, you should write the abstract as the last thing because then you have an idea of what you really want to project. Uh, introduction should be concise and immediately attract the attention and interest of the reader. It should provide important information regarding the case report like background epidemiological data and the novelty of the case report. And you mention how rare this condition is and why your case report is important. So, case presentation should be uh, the patient's story in chronological order in an easy and uh, easily, you know, understandable way. Uh, it should be in detail so that the person who reads it understands the conclusions easily and describe the history, examination, findings, investigations, treatment in that order without headings. Uh, but you should definitely have patient demographic features like age, sex and race. So, avoid unnecessary details, only mention the important positive and negative findings and try to include one or two images to keep the reader interested. So, discussion is the most important section and the selling point of the case report. Start by briefly expanding on your introduction, explaining why this case report is important and why, is it, a, why it should be of interest to the reader. Some of the current literature related to a case, describe what is already uh, described and how is it similar or different from what has been described in the literature. Explain the main hypothesis and theories that are pertinent to the clinical findings of your case and describe in detail the message that you're trying to convey through the case report, which may be in tandem to the current line of thinking or it may be contrary to the popular belief. Focus on the lessons that you learn from the case report and try to uh, put it in the case report and how this is going to affect the future clinical practice should be conveyed. So, you should summarize. Uh, and uh, evaluate the patient's case for accuracy, validity and uniqueness, compare and contrast with published literature reports, uh, see if there is any new knowledge which is derived and remember that the reviewers will be looking for evidence that your case report is unique or rare and it's going to give a new information. A well-written argument will certainly convince the journal that your case report is worthy of publication. So, conclusion should be brief. It's based on evidence reviewed in the discussion, emphasize on its practical applicability and stress on the insight which you learn from the case and suggest what you want to uh, convey that uh, new theory of a uh, new thing that you have highlighted in your case reports, uh, you, you should bring it out. So, the summary should be a summary of learning points. Try to convey it through three to four bullet points as a key message. And finally, you should have references. Last but not the least, title. Because this is very important, you should choose an interesting title because most people search for articles just by looking at the title. So, your important things, everything should be there, should be catchy. And develop the title only after you write the whole text so that all the important keywords are there in your title. So, the value of the case report, its teaching point, which makes it worthy of publishing. Show the novelty and uniqueness to the editor and the readers and focus on why is the case report important to the reader, why it should be published and who will read it. So, how to list the references? Read at the journal's instructions. Uh, do it in the style requested by the journal as a Vancouver or Harvard or whatever it is. Don't have too many references. Most will not have more than 10 and keep them relevant. How many authors should you have? Not many. The consultant and just one or two colleagues other than you and uh, decide on who is going to be the first author. If you are the one who is the primary con uh, concerned person, you should be the first author. Submitting your case report, proofread it, spelling, grammar, revisions, covering letter. Be prepared for rejection, revision and acceptance. Remember, you can't submit your, uh, your report to another journal while awaiting a decision from one journal. So, these are very important things that three essays search, sort, summarize, write it logically, proofread it and uh, read the fine print of your journal. 
choose the journal wisely. This is very important because most of the established journals do not have, is the time over? Okay. Established journals do not have case reports published in them. But the good thing is most of the important journals have a companion case report journal, like the American Journal of Ophthalmology and IGO has case reports. So they will publish your reports if it's worthy of it. Look at the impact factor and see the index, uh, whether it's an index journal or not. Most importantly, look at the publication fees before you submit it. See if you can afford it. See if you have an institutional backup. That's very important. So once it is accepted, it's celebration time. But you keep your eye out for the next interesting case. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Nina. That was very interesting. Uh, I want to share a small snippet about Dr. Jyotirmay Vishwas. He has his famous red diary where he would jot down whatever is unusual about even a very routine case that he sees. It's a very famous red diary. And so when he gets three or four such it cases, then he will decide to analyze it and then bring it forth for publication. And um, for the PGs, Dr. Jyotirmay Vishwas is a huge, huge uh, personality in the field of uveitis. Uh, another thing which you mentioned about publication fees, those are really monstrous. Uh, so uh, I think uh, people in one or more institutions can join together and uh, like compare their notes and join for two or more or three or more of up to five so that they can have a case series on a similar topic. It's very, very interesting. Thank you. Uh, re regarding the publication fees, there are many good journals uh, which do not have publication fees. I did not know this. I just assumed that all good journals will have exorbitant publication fees mainly because you get emails from all these predatory journals which say uh, all these things, anything will be accepted but the publication fees is so high. So there are very good journals who do not have publication fees. Just look for those journals and try in them. And some of the journals, they have publication fees only for the color photographs. So, if you are very careful and put only grayscale photographs when color photographs are not needed, you will have zero publication fees. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Dr. Ramya Raghavan and she is going to tell us how to write an original article. Dr. Ramya. Good afternoon. So how my topic is on how to write an original article. So what is an original article? So original article is the one that is written by a person or a number of persons uh, who have done the actual work, the actual research work. That is if you are going through many studies and then you are compiling and writing an article, then it is not an original article. So what is importance? Why should you write an original article? Uh, the, uh, it is um, if you are doing a research, then the result has to be shared with the world. So there are many ways to share uh, this, your result with the world, uh, but one of the common practices is to publish it in a very good scientific journal. And a researcher is known by the number of publications uh, in a good uh, scientific journal. So the first step in writing an original article is to do a thorough literature search. Like Dr. Nina said, you have to do a very thorough literature search. You, so you can use uh, the uh, different search engines, different platforms like uh, PubMed. So you go through different studies so that you can highlight the findings of your study. Now the second step is to identify a good, art, uh, uh, good journal. And then you go to their website, download the, or the author's guide. Go through the author's guide. So, all the instructions will be given in the author's guide. So, you have to go through that. Your articles design and organization, the bibliographical style, the format of tables and figures, everything is written in that. So, the reference style, the, uh, the uh, amount of words that can be included under each sex section, everything is written in the author's guide. So, you have to write the article according to that. Now, the third step is to write the article itself. So, uh, in order to uh, focus on your topic more clearly and uh, to make it more appealing, uh, original article writing can be done into different uh, parts, like seven different parts. 
So those include the title, authors and affiliations, then abstract and keywords, introduction, materials and methods, uh, then uh, the results, discussion and conclusion, acknowledgements, references, appendices or um, annexes. The first one is the title. So title is the one that should catch a person's interest, like you are uh, searching for something in the net and the title of your article comes up. So uh, that should be a catchy one. Then only a person will go and download the full text and go through it. And uh, uh, it should be a brief one, but you should uh, include something about the study design and it should have the essence of your article. Like uh, the different, uh, we, 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 in the first one you can see it is a retrospective analysis and uh, uh, important keywords should be there. Now next is authors and affiliations. So here the first author is the person who has contributed maximum towards the manuscript. The, or, the order of other authors like second order, uh, second author, third author. So that sequence is also determined by the, the related contribution towards the manuscript. You know, what is this affiliation? That is acknowledgement towards the institution or organization that has helped you with the research work. So here you can see the, the uh, authors uh, just below the title and uh, the affiliations below that. Now coming to abstract, again this is a, a very important part of the article. So here uh, you have to give uh, your, the important concepts of your um, uh, research work and the important outcomes also because uh, mostly if a person decides to go through the article then he will be going through the abstract first. So that has to contain everything about your article but it has to be a very brief one. So that is uh, the abstract. So you can see that uh, everything is included there, but uh, it has to be a very brief one. Then comes keywords. So keywords are very important because it increases the visibility of your article. And uh, the keywords have to be chosen very carefully. Uh, you should make sure that it is uh, a mesh word. And uh, the correct terms uh, regarding your work should be there as keywords. So then only it will come up uh, when a person does a search in the net. Next part is introduction. So here uh, you have to give the, the uh, why you chose this study, what is the importance of that particular matter, uh, what are the problems uh, that are unanswered and what is your claim, uh, what uh, you can do, about, what are you trying to prove. And here you can include uh, some minimum number of uh, references uh, under this particular part. Next is materials and methods. So here you are going to explain uh, the different steps of your study. That is if uh, another person wants to replicate the same study, he, he should be able to do so. So uh, the, uh, the different uh, steps of your study should be included under this, this particular part. Now comes the results. Here all the information that you gathered from your study should be included under results. But there is no need to uh, go further like you don't have to interpret your uh, uh, results here uh, because that is only you have to state the results. Interpretation is given under discussion part. Here the importance of the work, the why you did, what is the relevance of your study, that should be there in the discussion part. So you don't have to report, uh, repeat whatever you had written in the uh, introduction side part or uh, the results part here. Uh, but you, uh, the most important findings of your study can be included in maybe around three or four sentences as the beginning part of the discussion. And then uh, you can compare it with the other studies. Um, like what, uh, why is your study important or what are the similar studies or uh, what are the studies that uh, have given uh, contrasting result uh, and uh, why it is like that. So that can be discussed under uh, the discussion part. Next is conclusion. So here this is again a very brief one. So here you have to restate your topic and why it was important. You can uh, then you can uh, write about uh, your claim. Why what point where you are trying to prove and then you can give a few opposing uh, viewpoints and then you can say why 
uh, your point is highlighted why it should be highlighted and also don't forget to include something uh, about a possibility of a future research in this in the field now comes acknowledging part so again this is also a very a brief part of the manuscript so here uh, the, uh, you uh, acknowledgement is given to uh, all those who have directly contributed towards your study like uh, other authors non authors like colleagues funding sources uh, editing services etc but it has a very brief one you shouldn't be thanking a god your parents or spouse for their moral support here so it has to be an academic one now uh, next is references again this is very important uh, these uh, different styles of references are available so you have to uh, go through the authors guide once again look at the reference style which uh, that is preferred by the journal and then you accordingly you set your references and uh, the it is listed uh, in the uh, order in which they appear in the manuscript and uh, make sure that it is less than 5 years old and uh, try to choose it from some original article not a review article that is a references part now annexes or appendices uh, both are supporting or additional information and uh, appendices are actually part of the manuscript but comes uh, at the as the last part of the manuscript that is after references uh, they are usually very small whereas annexes are uh, larger uh, amount of work uh, or additional information that is submitted separately that is annexes so that's all about uh, my topic thank you thank you smita madam and ksos for including me in your rice thank you dr rajesh ramya uh, for that very simple presentation which we all enjoyed uh, i i hope all of you know about it but um for a original article when you are writing a prospective study you need consent of the patients as well as the institutional review board uh, approval but if you are having a retrospective study then you do not need patient consent consent but you still need an institutional review board because sometimes we in our journal get a lot of queries in this regard it's like a blanket no need of consent for retrospective studies it is not so you still need an institutional review board approval thank you very much so our next speaker is going to give us a lot of ideas out of the box thinking styles so Dr. Ashok Natraj, thinking out of the box to publish. So, actually, you know, this this cross was taken. by myself upon me actually this out of the box <laughs> so i cannot complain so thinking out of the box means initially i thought you know i i just i just sat in at a box and started looking out i mean whether i get any ideas so thinking out of the box means you know it is it, it is something like it should be out of the world you know it, it should not be straight forward like you know you want to do something you know how to really uh, how to really we do uh, thinking out of the box means doing something really weird and wacky so when i went through the net no see there was about thinking out of the box i mean this is a puzzle okay you got these nine dots now you should use only four lines okay and when you are joining all these you have to join all these dots okay and you should use only four lines and uh, every time you are you should not take your pen off when you are drawing the line you should not take it out it should be continuous and you should not go over the line back and forth again okay so how are you going to do it so this is the funda of out of the box okay so this is without lifting the pen or over drawing on a line how will you do it okay so this is how you should do it so what you do is uh, you go like this you would go like this you go like this and you come so it is like you know you are going out of the framework okay you are you are not within the framework of uh, normal thing you are going out of the framework see whenever we say you know you have to solve something you want to remain within those dots correct 
so when you have to think out of the box you have to go outside the framework and that is why you know all i mean all realized souls and all that they go out of the framework and we are all within the framework so that's a different so that is the importance of thinking out of the box okay so i think you should meditate a little bit before you think out of the box mm -hmm. so this is a famous saying by sherlock holmes you see but you do not observe so he always tells watson whenever you know he is able to deduce lot of things from a crime scene watson says i am also saying the same thing how do you understand so he says you see but you do not observe that's something which commonly he says so now you know i have two situations one in medical retina and one in surgical retina in retrospective analysis i thought i thought out of the box so i'm just trying to present it's not theory it's just two cases that's all okay so this is case 1 this is a patient this is a fundus photo as you know the left eye and this patient is having diabetes okay this patient is having diabetes and this is a right eye okay and you can see maybe you can say mild npdr or uh, very mild diabetic retinopathy and uh, this was the patient's left eye on presentation so what you can see is you can see a hump there no? thumb so that is this is a fovea hump close to the fovea means there is macular edema uh, close to the fovea and you can see a red dot here see a red dot red dot correct so this is a section through the red dot okay through the red dot and what you can see you can see one round thing no round thing okay so when i saw this patient i thought it was diabetic macular edema so nothing to be done uh, cme is a minimal cme there is an erm also so you observe okay then okay as uh, madam was selling the red book red book uh, the uh, by the way we are keeping red books there all pgs you can buy we are sponsoring all red books are there <laughs> you can take it when you go so it's it's like i saw this patient i just left it then after some time another patient came he was having mild npdr in one eye and with the more moderate npdr in the right eye uh, with macular edema so similar thing okay similar thing and when i did an ocd you can see the ffa image here you can see a dot here a dot here which is enlarging and when you take an ocd through that you can see one white thing here see this is also common for this patient okay so this is basically a capillary which has become enlarged okay this is a capillary which has become really enlarged so uh, a new concept something called pvac p e v a c that's called peripheral exudative vascular anomalous complex i was saying it again and again so that i should not miss it now only i also got it so you don't have to worry not back shadow you can see a round thing no you can see a round round here this is a giant dilated capillary this is a pvac lesion so but unfortunately in all our literature pvac occurs in patients who don't have diabetes and uh, who have controlled hypertension so that doesn't fit our bill you know because these patients are diabetes correct so whether these pvac kind of lesions are causing macular edema so that is our next question so we have to think out of the box we have to go out of the framework of diabetic retinopathy see it's like you tie your calf to the coconut tree and talk about the coconut tree it is something like that okay so like that then you know uh, we gave anti vegf this is diabetic macular edema can we keep on giving anti vegf but the patient didn't respond to any anti vegf you can see this dilated capillary here not responding to anti vegf then we gave osidex there was a good response but unfortunately after two or three months you know again it recurred and we had to keep on giving osidex so then only we did a literature search and we found that this is exactly how a pvac lesion will respond they don't respond to anti vegf at all and this was one of the first reports where they were responding to Uh, what do you say? Osidex intravitreal injection. So we call it PVAC light lesion because we cannot say PVAC for because for PVAC the patient should not have diabetes, control hypertension, and you know I, I I should not say I got IGA certificate of merit award for this. I love with Madam who got the best reviewer award for IGA, so that she cannot complain. No, I'm saying my own thing. That's why. <laughs> Okay, so this is kind of thinking out of the box. So I followed this up. I followed this up. This is another case, similar presentation. You have this macular edema here. Okay, so right eye diabetic retinopathy. Patient has diabetic retinopathy. Okay, in the right eye, you can see microlensings. Left eye, the same hyper hyperfluorescence there. 
and you can see this dot here and you can see this dyne anode is appearing again appearing okay this is my three you have to give anti wedge no okay i gave anti wedge if i gave also dex nothing is working then what i did was i did focal laser to this giant anodes okay focal laser focal laser flat see macroedema is decreasing macroedema is gone so that so that is the key you know that point is the key the other patient i didn't give focal laser because it's very close to the fovea if you give focal laser macroedema also will go vision also will go so we don't want that so this is very much away from the fovea and this is how so this is something you know see uh, this is you have to get out of the framework of diabetic retinopathy new things can happen so what they say about pvac is there is reduced expression of metalloproteases in the basement membrane so that causes greater pericyte loss and that leads to this giant macronism kind of thing forming spare is called as rcma retinal capillary macronism you can call it by any name but this is what happens and this can occur even with like you know diabetic retinopathy or you know controlled i mean even in hypertensive so this is one thing i would like to say so this is like thinking out of the box you give focal laser to that i didn't do anything else just focal laser over a period of one or two months whole macular edema resolved okay then i will show you one case in surgical retina okay. so the theme here is necessity is the mother of invention see you do things only when you are pushed to the wall so you don't know where you can climb the wall unless and until a dog really chases you and you are running for your life okay so that is the basic thing about necessity is the mother of invention so when i do macular rolls no i do something called as inverse flap technique so i, I don't know i mean i'll just tell you see when you're doing macular hole you do something called as vitrectomy you remove the vitreous and you go on top of the retina retina has got 10 layers okay the innermost layer is called internal limiting membrane so this internal limiting membrane is known to cause tangential traction and that is why macular hole is there and you have to remove the internal limiting membrane so the macular hole closes so when there is a big macular hole or you feel macular hole will not close in regular surgery what you do is you peel the internal limiting membrane but you the from the edge of the macular hole whatever internal limiting membrane you have peeled you stuff it into the fovea okay and that is called as inverse flap technique and improves the closure rate so what uh, what happened this when i was doing this process i just lost the ilm flap now i don't know what to do how can i put the internal limiting membrane i just lost it because it's a fine thing around the hole you have to peel and just stuff it inside so i just lost it what will you do so this is what i did i this is the whole thing uh, the, the peel lost flap and this is a macular hole and uh, the green thing is remaining internal limiting membrane so i took a peel from the edge and i took it and i stuffed it in the fovea cent Okay, this happened at the moment. I never thought about this. I, I was pushed to the wall, and instantly I thought I should do this, and I did this. So I'll just show you a video how I did this. Okay, so this is the internal limiting membrane peeling. You can see. So I'm just tucking it in. See, this is called the tuck. You have peeled it. Now you just see. Got it. Lost. Flap is gone. Now what can you do? Then see. You can see it's it's going from there. on the side i peel i peel i peel i peel there and take that slowly i bring it it's not 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 too much time to worry and bring it close and stuff it out of the fovea see so this is one out of the box technique uh, that you can do So this is the outcome. This is the open hole peel. You can see it there, and the macular hole is closed. This is something called as the outer retinal defect. People who have this outer retinal defect have very good prognosis. Don't think that there is a hole and patient loss vision. Okay. So this is another case. Again, a loss flap. This is another case. This happened after I did fluid air exchange. See, once you do a reverse flap technique, and then you fill it with air, and then you exchange it with C three F A. Now this I was doing really well. You can see I'm I'm peeling, putting it in the center of the hole. Everything is okay. Now I'm trimming the flap. Okay, because you don't want a big flap. You trim it with cutter so that it remains in the center. Now also it's okay. Yeah, it's it's staying. Now I fill it with C. Well, this is called inverse flap. You put the flap on the fovea. Now I'm like you know filling it with air. That's called fluid air exchange. Okay, so you you can see it's 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 getting filled with air. See, air is air is filling. Now, because you know when you fill air, the flap will move a little bit to the one side. So you want to tuck it back to the fovea. So unfortunately, with the flute only I tried. 
So if I'm, I'm tucking it in, I'm tucking it in, I'm still not satisfied. Then what happens is this, this flap just comes off. You know, from the center you can see. See, flap is gone. Now what will do is under air also. Now you cannot remove the air. But I under the air, I want to do the same thing. Okay. So again, I do the same thing. I take it off, take it off, take it off. Because under the under air, it's really challenging because visual is, visual, visualization is really bad. No? So under the air, I will be challenging and I just do it. And uh, that's it, same thing. And this is the result. This is perfectly closed. Okay. So unfortunately, when I went back, you know, in 2015, a Japanese fellow has done the same thing, even without my knowledge. And it has already come in cataract surgery and uh, ophthalmic surgery and lasers, the same technique, what he has used. So the same thing can happen, you know, I, I've never read that article before. I, I read it in the spur of the moment, but same thing can happen. But ideally, I got it published in the VRSI journal, I could present on the VRSI also. VRSI is Veterinary Society of India meeting, VRSI. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs>
in the news, that is the lay present news, the newspapers, these are the things which come in regular news. So, Kerala girl, 11 years old, who develops AI app to detect eye diseases with 70% accuracy. And AI outperforms ophthalmologists at detecting eye disease. Charge the GPT generates fake data set to support scientific hypothesis. So all journal editors watch out. All these uh, all these fake data is now very easy to uh, very easy to create now. Diabetic retinopathy oh, uh, there is now an FDA approved device. That is a software and software device which is FDA approved for um, giving out reports. And of course the remedio Medios AI, that is an offline AI capable now. That means it doesn't need to connect to a server. From the iPhone itself, it can do basic um, AI processing. It can detect whether the patient has diabetic retinopathy or not. For grading, it also go to the server. We have some others. Pegasus is available for free from the um, uh, from the online uh, connection, you can just go and use their service for free. Okay, this is uh, or this cyber site. They use the Pegasus uh, AI, and you can register there as an ophthalmologist and use their AI to analyze your retina images absolutely free. Okay, glaucoma. Even the basic segmentation of the images is actually AI, but we don't mind that much. And AOCT AI can be used. Sensimet Triggerfish is an IOP machining device, continuous IOP machining device. AI was used to convert the stretch indicators into IOP readings. And the glaucomerous coupling can be uh, measured. This is a very favorite project of all engineering students for the past few years. And visual fields, you know, that is perimetry. AI can detect three perimetric visual field effects. Okay, so perimetry can be used to detect pre-perimetric defects, and they can uh, AI can do so many things in visual fields. AI can even predict the future visual fields. So this particular group, they trained an AI with 32,000 visual fields, and the AI was able to predict the future for the next five and a half years based on the personalized uh, target IOPs. So this is one of the actual visual field and one of the predicted visual field. ROP has several tools for AI analysis of the images and isolated macular degeneration is another one. There is an app available on the app store, Fluid Intelligence, which can uh, look at OCT and tell you about uh, edema. Retinal vascular occlusions can be analyzed by AI. OCT can be analyzed not only in segmentation but detection of several things such as ERM and uh, diabetic neuropathy and ARMD and all that. Several other diseases, so uh, retinal detachment, PEDs, all these can be segmented and detected by AI. Keratoconus, you can identify keratoconus and form of uh, from placebo. And uh, all these, all these devices now have AI analysis also built in and uh, confocal microscopy can also be analyzed by AI. Cataract, so detecting cataract and corneal arcus is also another favorite AI project of school children. Retinopathy is by college students, cataract is by school children. Very simple to make all these uh, software. You can make it yourself also for free, but you can grade cataract from not only slit lamp images, also from ultrasound, also from fundus photographs. Fundus photographs for grading cataract. Okay, so it can also predict the risk of PCO, and also you can segment the IOs for studies. Periodic ophthalmology AI can scan through public photographs to look for leukocoria. Okay. This is a very common uh, diagnosis, uh, 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 this thing, your patients will tell you, somebody told from a photograph, your kid's eye looks different, please go show an eye doctor, and they come to the ophthalmologist. So this is a common scenario, AI can go through Facebook, Instagram, look for children's photographs, look at their eyes, and then send an AI message telling go to an eye doctor. So that is possibly in the future, privacy concern, but definitely possible in the future. Can predict future high myopia, diagnose 
reading disabilities, you can plan surgical uh, recessions, recessions, everything can be planned with AI. And without staining, AI can potentially demarcate the border of AI sessions. So this can be used uh, because AI can detect subtle differences. And also, uh, even in uh, BCC surgery, any micro um, surgeries, you can find the margins, you can predict the prognosis as well. You can predict refractive error progression. You can also predict based on several things such as height, weight, biometry and other things. You don't need to have the exact measurements. You can predict the future, uh, future of that patient's eye. And not only that, AI can predict not only the eye, it can predict cognitive impairment, dementia, Alzheimer's disc, stroke risk, cardiovascular risk, all these things. Because there was a study in 2018 by Google where the AI was able to tell whether that fungus belonged to a male patient or female patient. I haven't met any ophthalmologist who can tell that. You can say whether the patient uh, is a smoker or non-smoker, what is their approximate HbA1c, what is their BMI. Basically, it's like, uh, you know, it's very, very amazing how how much the retina can tell. And uh, there is a uh, lot of research going on about Alzheimer's and also about Parkinson's. Why AI? A lot of things cheaper, faster, scalable. Some more publications. Now, about AI and publications, ChatGPT released in November 22 has been creating wave after wave, and there are several articles which have been written with the help of AI, okay? Acknowledgement, AI is used for the publication, but that is not all. AI has been used as an author. Some publications have listed ChatGPT as a co-author. Okay, that is not really allowed, but it's being listed. Uh, can we trust ChatGPT? Not really. Several, several problems are there with trusting ChatGPT. I can tell ChatGPT write about chloroquine eye drops as a treatment of cataract. It will write an article. It will write an entire article within seconds. This is real time. And it will give you citations, everything. I can change it to anything I want. I can link any two things. It will write an article. So, <laughs> this particular journal removed ChatGPT from the co-authors list. They said the first author became aware of the problem and sorry, sorry and all that. And they pro produced a, a published a correspondent. Okay. But several others are still listing ChatGPT as a co-author. And uh, ChatGPT can be used to enhance pure images. So this image can be enhanced with, uh, sorry, not ChatGPT, with AI. AI image enhancers. It can be enhanced from very bad images to better images. You can generate images. So these uh, double people, multicolor eyes, all generated by AI. You can just tell you, uh, tell what you want and it will generate. And this particular study, all these are AI images. Realistic, high resolution retina images. Okay. And also this one from OCT, it was able to uh, generate flow maps. This is not an octa image, but it can generate an octa image from a single OCT. And these are also image generation with AI. You won't know the difference. AI can be used to make this presentation also. I did not, but these are the slides, the slides you can use. You can just go say you want to make a presentation. It will make a presentation for you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. John. Uh, that was quite an enlightening talk. Uh, I guess AI is just like nuclear energy. Uh, it can be... It, is useful in certain areas like detection of disease or predicting prognosis of a condition. So that is good, but creating a data set and uh, uh, helping with the publication, that is quite alarming. Next, uh, we have uh, uh, Dr. Smita Narayan talking to us about what happens to a manuscript after it is submitted. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Now that you have heard how to write an original article and how to write an excellent case report, how to get out of the box ideas and enhance it with AI, let me tell you what happens to a manuscript after it is submitted. So I shall be giving you with my perspective as the outgoing editor of the Kerala Journal of Ophthalmology and also as a reviewer to some journals and also as an author to a large number of journals. 
So why does why does a journal exist? A journal exists or any journal exists because they want to publish our research. But a journal also needs to improve its impact factor year after year. And for that, they need to publish outstanding research. Now, we are not, all of us are not Nobel Prize winners or who can get uh, out of the box ideas like certain people here. But, so we are more likely to face rejections. So please take it to your heart that rejection is the norm in academic publishing. It is persistence which is the key. So keeping that in mind, let me tell you about the process of how a manuscript goes from the submission stage to the acceptance stage. So once the manuscript is submitted, it is assessed by a senior editor or a technical editor for, to perform a technical review. If it is not rejected at this stage, it is then taken up by an associate or assistant editor in the editorial board who does a baseline scientific review. Again, if it is not rejected, it goes to the reviewer who decides whether to review or not. And if the reviewer decides to review and then gives an approval, then the article is taken up then the article is taken up by the editorial board which provides further approval. So let us look at what happens to the editorial workflow in greater detail. So once the manuscript is submitted, it reaches the editor's inbox in the dashboard provided by the publisher and the manuscript is then looked for a technical check. Technical check means all those fine details which are provided in the journal's website right from the title, is it too long, to the references, whether they are in the correct site, whether they have been cited properly in the journal, whether they are in the right order, all those things including the photographs, are they given in the TIFF or the JPEG format, are the tables given in a form of a picture, so those things are all checked. And it is sent back to the author if the manuscript lacks any of those and then it is resubmitted. Then the article goes for a baseline scientific review. Now baseline scientific review is performed by a young enthusiastic uh, technical uh, editor who is an associate editor, assistant editor and they make their decision by looking whether the article type is correct or not. So if there are more than five cases it is like a, it's not a case series, instead it's like an original, it is an original article. They look at the language, whether scientific language is utilized in writing the article and not a layman's language, not too many adjective, adjectives are utilized. They look for the completion, so whether it has the IMRAD format, I'm, I hope all of you are familiar with the IMRAD format and also whether there is an abstract along with the article. Um, the assistant editor also looks to the scope of the article and the significance of that article with respect to the current knowledge that is available and also with respect to the view, uh, the readership of the journal and the possible impact it will have on the readers as well as on the journal itself. So at these stages, what are the reasons for editorial rejection at these stages? It has not gone to the reviewer because the, the assistant editor who does a baseline scientific review, that is the person who makes it ready for the editor. The reasons for mismatch which are unrelated to the manuscript quality include a manuscript journal mismatch. So I'll give you an example. We had a submission where they had developed a scale so that the GPs and nurses can look at, an, look at a patient and decide whether this patient can be sent to an ophthalmologist or not. not. That is whether the condition of the patient is severe enough to be sent to an ophthalmologist. So as ophthalmologists, we are not interested in that kind of a, um, of a, a manuscript and so that was rejected. Sometimes it is space constraints. During COVID times, we had so many articles, but now the number of articles has come down to a trickle and so the space constraints are again a reason why sometimes your article is not published on time. So sometimes there may be a similar submission which has been published or which has been, which is under active consideration. Again, I'll give you an example. During COVID times, we had ex published an excellent article on mucormycosis. So when other um, articles are submitted about mucormycosis, even though they are very good, we are unable to publish similar articles. Now sometimes editorial rejection is because of reasons which are related to the manuscript quality. 
These reasons may not be scientific. They could be because there is a poor writing or poor organization or it is having a poor rationale or very importantly it could be a flawed methodology. That is it is not reproducible. Sometimes there is no IRB approval or it, uh, if it is a clinical trial it is not registered. So once the article is ready for peer review, just what is a peer review? A peer review is the evaluation of the work by one or more people of similar competence to the authors. So the peer reviewer is either somebody who is a young person who will, who has the same standing as the author or and another person who has a higher standing and higher experience as the author. So the peer review methods are employed to maintain the standards of quality and improve the performance and provide credibility. So peer review also is used to determine an academic paper's suitability for publication. Now a peer review is not such a horrible brutal process like this but you should take this constructive criticism provided by the peer reviewer and utilize it to improve in writing your article. Now, why, what are the core values of peer review? Most importantly, of all the eight values that are written over here, the most important is confidentiality. The peer reviewer should not take the ideas of that article and provide it to another person or use by himself or herself. These are why we do a peer review. The peer review process should be reproducible, including that it is true and credible. It, it should assess whether it has been the, uh, the theme has been communicated effectively. Is there plagiarism in the article? And also, it, the peer reviewer should provide critical but constructive feedback regarding the article. This peer review process is a double blind process. The reviewer does not know who the author or the institution is but uh, many a times you can find out by the way these people are writing you can find out about the institution. Peer review report consists of two parts. The first part is part which is there in the dashboard of the uh, journal itself which tells about the novelty and the comprehensive nature or accuracy etc. And the second part is the actual peer reviewers comments. So once your article is approved by the peer reviewer and it's out, uh, we have to know what is its outcome if it is not rejected. So it can be accepted without any modifications. That is very, very rare. Frederick Jacobi was the only person whose articles were accepted without any modifications. For lesser models like us, it could be a major revision with re-review where there is about a 70% chance of acceptance. Or it could be a minor revision where it is 95% chance of acceptance. So how do you respond to the peer reviewer's comments? So you keep your screen with your peer reviewer's comments on one side and then you make a table with three columns. You write down the peer reviewer's comments in each column and you give your response to the peer reviewer's comments in a very respectful and humble manner. And this response should be either that whether you agree with those comments or it could be a rebuttal but that should be very in a very decent language. And you can give the location of the changes that you have made in the with respect to the page number or and uh, the column and the line and also you can highlight it in the main body of the manuscript. So what if your article is rejected? You have four options. You can submit to another journal without any changes or you can submit to another journal with the changes suggested by the peer reviewer. Unusually and rarely you can appeal and to the given journal and wait for their response or you can move on. Once your article is accepted, it goes through a copy editing process where the journal language editors do final correction and formatting and there is a lot of back and forth movement of the article between the author and the editors and finally typesetting is done and the final check is done with respect to the author. And then your product comes online or in print. So is the process over? So no. So you can look at the impact that you have created by looking at the citations. So three citations, three options, Google Scholar, Scopus and Web of Science. And also you can look at your journal's impact factor and the H index or ITIN index. So thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you very much for participating.
Thank you, madam. Uh, you made the complex process so uh, seem to be very simple one. Thank you so much. I would like to add that the citation part of it, that is writing the citations, bibliography is very easy, especially for KGO. It is uh, KGO is listed in the Zotero um, uh, citations manager. So you go to Zotero, install Zotero. KGO Kerala Journal of Ophthalmology is one of the options in which uh, you, you can select in that. You can make citations very easily.